Good afternoon, everyone. This is Anna Norton at Diabetes Sisters. Um, this afternoon, you have joined us um, to participate in a, our life class webinar on diabetes and physical fitness. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this very important webinar. Um, again, this is Anna Norton, and I'm the interim CEO of Diabetes Sisters. I will be moderate, moderating this webinar today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them along in the side panel on your screen. And at the end of the webinar, if we have time, we will present the questions. Um, so feel free to do so. Um, I will be offline once Ginger starts the presentation to, um, to, to answer your questions as well. Um, I'm excited to introduce Ginger Vieira. She is a very longtime friend to Diabetes Sisters. She served on the faculty of the National Weekend for Women Conference Series. She contributes articles to our website and our monthly newsletter. Um, Ginger has lived with diabetes and celiac disease since 1999. She's a certified cognitive coach and diabetes coach. She works with clients across the globe. In addition to all of this, she's a published author writing books such as Dealing with Diabetes Burnout, Your Diabetes Science Experiment, and Emotional Eating with Diabetes. She currently lives in, in Vermont with her husband and her brand new baby. Um, I'd like to welcome Ginger to lead us in the next half hour on diabetes and exercise. So Ginger, it's all yours. All right, hi everybody. So we're gonna be talking about exercise and diabetes, basically blood sugar management, the basics of blood sugar management, but not the basics that you get from your doctor where they say, you know, eat 15 grams of carbs and then go for it because it's actually a bit more complicated than that. But at the same time, once you understand the basics that we're about to talk about, it's not so complicated that you can't apply it and get better blood sugar results and better sanity from your own exercise goals. And what, I mean, the main goal for me is to make sure that you guys have a foundation of knowing that blood sugars during exercise are not random. It's not irrational, it's not illogical. There's actually some really clear physiology that's going on in your body during different types of exercise. And you can predict a great deal of that and plan for it. So that's my goal today, okay? So the very first thing during exercise is absolutely our blood sugar because obviously if we're low, we're not going to be able to exercise. But if we're high, it is just as much of an issue because one, if you're exercising for weight loss, your body is not burning fat in a productive or healthy way. There's obviously fat loss that can come from very severe de DKA and ketones, but you probably wouldn't be exercising in that situation. But just a regular high, like 220 milligram milligrams per deciliter, that level of a high during exercise is going to hinder your performance, your, your muscles ability to perform, to do the work. You're going to be dehydrated. Your blood sugar will probably go a little higher if you're dehydrated and you're not going to be getting the benefits of that fat burning weight loss goal if that is one of your goals. So if you're somebody who has classically made your blood sugar purposely up in the 200s in order to get through your workout and not have to worry about going low, I really want to encourage you to set aside that way of thinking and really Find the energy and just determination to learn a new way of managing your blood sugar during exercise because doing that 200 and above thing is really going to cause more harm than good and prevent you from reaching your goals. So how the heck do you do that? All right. The first thing is to really know the difference between aerobic and anaerobic exercise and know what type of exercise you're doing. So if you're going for a jog or if you're doing weightlifting in the gym, that's two different types of exercise and you're going to plan for that in two very different ways. So let's talk about first just quickly how you know the difference between the two. Aerobic exercise, and here's some examples, jogging, spinning, Zumba, elliptical, power walking, all of these things, if you see this line here, this is your heart rate. And during all of these types of exercise, you know it's aerobic when your heart rate goes up and then stays elevated for an extended period of time because you're doing a constant movement. It's keeping your body working at the same rate for an extended period of time. What does that period of time mean? I mean, even 10 minutes of jogging, you probably know, can drop your blood sugar quite a bit. So the reason that's doing that is because when your heart rate is up 
for that extended period of time, whether it's 10 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour, your body's first use of fuel is going to be the glucose in your bloodstream. And that's because when your heart rate's up that high, your body can't get energy, can't get uh, burn fat cells for energy quickly enough and can't get oxygen to those fat cells to use them for energy quickly enough to actually keep going. So instead it uses what's the easiest access is the glucose in your blood. So I fumbled that up a bit. I want to state that one more time. Your body can't get oxygen to the fat cells quickly enough when your heart rate is up and up for a constant period of time. And when I say up, generally starting around 120 beats per minute is when people start utilizing glucose for fuel if your heart rate stays up there for an extended period of time. Okay. So other types of this might be just riding your bike, dancing, a jazzercise class where even though you might stop for a minute in between songs, most of the time you're pretty much moving. So think about next time you do your workout, think about how your body is working. Is your heart rate up and you're working at the same pace for an extended period of time? Or are you doing an anaerobic workout? So spinning is something that could be aerobic or anaerobic depending on how you do it. If you were just spinning at a pace that you could maintain for 20, 30 minutes, that's going to be aerobic. But spinning classes often have peaks of intensity where you're suddenly working really, really hard, and then you bring it down to a really easy pace so that your heart rate comes back down. And then you're working really, really hard, and then you bring it back down to an easy pace so your heart rate comes back down. Those easy paces are your recovery period. The intensity period is when your heart rate's going up and up and up. And that could be 170 beats per minute. That could be 140. The point is, though, that it's going up and it's coming way down. And when I say way down, obviously starting at 120 and lower, but usually a true recovery period, you'd be down at 100 beats or lower per minute. So another example of this is a weightlifting workout, circuit training, right? You've got maybe three different weightlifting exercises in a row, and you do one, then the other, then the other, and then you rest. Maybe you go to the water fountain, then you repeat. That's a classic interval workout with weightlifting. So even though you might feel like you're working really hard the whole time, and you might feel like your heart is beating through your chest the whole time, you're actually, you know, when you're doing that first weightlifting workout, let's say uh, exercise, let's say it's um, push-ups is the first one, and then squats is the second one, and then bicep curls is the third exercise. You're resting in between each of those exercises, even though you're doing them boom, 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 but you're also, your body is working so hard during those push-ups, but it's such a small, small period of time compared to a 20-minute jog where your body is working straight through. So that big burst of energy and then the decline in your heart rate or the big burst of energy and then relaxing and moving quickly to the next exercise, that is your body doing an anaerobic workout. And the reason this is anaerobic and you don't burn glucose for fuel nearly as much as aerobic workouts is because when your heart rate is coming back down, your body can actually get oxygen to those fat cells quickly enough to burn fat for energy. So you might have noticed that when you jog for 20 minutes, your blood sugar plummets. But when you do your workout in the gym with weights, you're working really hard. Your heart is pumping, you're sweating, but your blood sugar might even go up a little bit. And people often think that's from adrenaline, but a true workout that is going to actually cause your body to release adrenaline, that's really not going to happen just in the gym during an average workout. That's going to happen when you're chasing somebody down the field with a soccer ball and it's intense. The blood sugar rise during weightlifting is actually commonly part of it is from this that we've just talked about, but the other part is that you're breaking down muscle and that muscle has glucose in it and it's being broken down and then your body is actually going to release a little more glycogen from your liver to cycle back to that muscle to help replenish and get more fuel to then perform for the next set of push-ups. So that's actually what can cause a rise in blood sugar during an anaerobic workout. Okay? So how the heck do you prepare for that? Well, let's talk first about one very easy way to exercise without having your blood sugar drop 
or go high. There's a few different versions of this type of walking. The first is steady state walking. It's really boring. Bodybuilders do it because you walk really, really slow and you're just burning fat and not muscle. And a bodybuilder is trying to preserve as much muscle but get rid of the fat before a show. So when I say steady state, I mean like two miles per hour, which is not anywhere close to a power walk. It's probably what my grandmother would walk it's very slow so that is a slow enough pace that even though you're doing a constant exercise your heart rate is staying probably you know no higher than 100 beats per minute so you're not burning glucose for fuel you're just burning fat for fuel another time that this would work is fasted so you could power walk meaning not steady state but an actually really vigorous walking pace if you don't eat breakfast if your blood sugar is in the range that you feel safe walking at, so let's say that's 120 milligrams per deciliter, and you haven't eaten breakfast, and then you go for that hour, two hour power walk, and I can speak from experience that I can walk first thing in the morning with a steady blood sugar, no breakfast, and my blood sugar does not drop. And the reason that is, and this is true in a non-diabetic as well, is that because your body hasn't gotten any food yet, your body is still in that fasted state where it's burning body fat for fuel instead of glucose because it's just trying to conserve energy because you have not fed it yet. So for those of us with type 1 diabetes, that means that we also haven't taken any fast-acting insulin for a meal. If you have a pump, sure, you're getting your basal rate amount of insulin, but that shouldn't be an issue. As long as you haven't eaten breakfast and bolus for that food, your body is still going to be burning body fat for fuel instead of glucose. Now, if I did that same power walk after lunch, my blood sugar would plummet. I'd have to drink juice the whole time during the walk to keep it up. Fasted first thing in the morning, not an issue. Every year at the Diabetes Sisters Conference, we talk about this, and the next morning, a bunch of people decide to try it because it's such a weird concept, and your doctor never explained it to you because this is exercise physiology. This isn't something you would learn from a doctor. Personal trainers, that's where I learned it from, my powerlifting coach. I didn't believe him the first time, so I, I did my walk, but I took some glucose tabs before. My blood sugar was high. Okay, fine. So then the next day, I took a few less glucose tabs, did the walk. Blood sugar is still a little high. I finally gave in. I didn't take any glucose tabs. I just went for my walk. My blood sugar stayed right around 100, and I realized, okay, fasted walking. First thing in the morning is the easiest time of day to burn body fat and not worry about my blood sugar. If you do try this, do remember that, you know, check your blood sugar often the first few times. If your basal rates aren't accurate and you're getting more insulin during the morning in your basal rates than you need, then that will throw off this experiment. So at the same time, you can do a basal rate test. I'd highly recommend doing a basal test before doing this fasted walking. Um, and if you need help with basal rate testing, I also recommend Jennifer Smith at integrateddiabetes.com. She's a CDE. She's also somebody to go to if you are thinking about more intense extreme sports like marathons, Ironmans, any of that more higher level kind of uh, exercise. Talk to Jenny, Jennifer at integrateddiabetes.com. Anna's going to share that email address in the chat window of our conversation um, during this webinar. So definitely reach out to her. But the other thing to remember if you're doing that fasted walking is the cream in your coffee. Everybody re reacts a little different to coffee. Some people, caffeine sends their blood sugar up 200 points. For me, I know that half a cup of black coffee in the morning does not affect my blood sugar. Half a cup in the afternoon, the caffeine absolutely does affect my blood sugar. But in the morning, I know that I can drink that half cup of black coffee and go for my fasted walk and my blood sugar still doesn't drop. So just keep in mind, this is something we often forget of as food. There are calories in that cream. So that would tell your body, okay, you've had calories now. I don't have to conserve and I can start burning glucose for fuel. So that will mess up that fasted walking if you do put cream in your coffee. Okay? All right. The other question to ask yourself when you start any type of exercise, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic, is how long has it been since I took any bolus insulin? Because especially with aerobic exercise, if you want to do your jog after lunch, you just took bolus insulin. You just took insulin for that meal. So you're going to be that much more sensitive to that insulin. I would recommend trying 
doing your workout before you eat that lunch, before you take that insulin. If it's been several hours since you took insulin, it's not quite the same as that fasted power walk because you've already eaten that day, you probably ate breakfast, so your body is burning more glucose for fuel than body fat when at rest. But think about the timing because you'll have more trouble with low blood sugars if you're exercising right after you took a bunch of insulin, especially aerobic exercise. However, with anaerobic exercise, I know when I was training in powerlifting, Thing, and that's an extreme anaerobic, my blood sugar would usually rise 50 or so points. So I actually took insulin before my workout, despite not having any food, or if I ate a meal, I'd take insulin for the meal plus a little more for the workout. Okay, And that same uh, logic can apply with a fasted anaerobic workout. So because an anaerobic workout can raise blood sugar a little bit, if you want to do that workout before you've eaten breakfast, maybe you don't have time for breakfast, maybe you just feel better exercising on an empty stomach. Ideally, we eat, you know, we fuel our bodies before an intense workout, but you don't have to. If you're not training for some intense event, it's okay to go to the gym on an empty stomach. I know that in my body, if I go to the gym on an empty stomach and I do interval training or weightlifting, my blood sugar will go up at least 70, 80 points. So I actually take a unit of insulin for my body to prevent that spike from that anaerobic workout on an empty stomach. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how you would go about balancing your blood sugar around aerobic or anaerobic. And now we're talking about your diabetes science experiment, but I'm gonna give you examples of my body. So just keep in mind that this is what I know works for my body. Your body's going to be a little different. The physiology, the logic of it should be the same, but the numbers of how many grams work for me is going to be a little different than how many grams work for you, etc. Okay? So the first thing is to know what type of workout are you doing. Test your blood sugar, of course. Anything you eat, write that down. What did you eat? Just write it down. Take good notes. Did you eat the same lunch you eat every day? Write it down. How much insulin you took for that meal? Your blood sugar. Check your blood sugar 15 to 20 minutes when you're doing this experiment or when you're starting a new type of exercise. When I first started trying to see if I liked swimming, which it turns out I don't, I checked my blood sugar, got out of the pool after 10, 15 minutes because I had no idea how swimming was really going to affect my blood sugar, even though I knew it was an aerobic exercise because I'm going back and forth at a constant pace, I didn't know how quickly that type of aerobic exercise was going to cause me to drop compared to jogging, compared to riding my bike. Then test after another 15 to 20 minutes and your blood sugar at completion. So these last three blood sugar checks are obviously partly for safety, but it's also for good note taking because you need to know what's going on in your body during that type of workout and maybe at what point it really started to rise. Because another time you could check also is an hour after completion, especially with anaerobic exercise. For me with a powerlifting workout, which was intense anaerobic workout, I actually needed insulin after I finished exercising because I had just depleted all the glycogen in my muscles. I'd broken down so much muscle and my body was working really hard to replenish that glycogen, which is stored glucose in the muscle tissue. So if I didn't eat a meal right after working out, my blood sugar would go up 100 points because my liver is helping get some glycogen back into my muscles. Okay, so keep that in mind. There's logic. I'm sure all of you have had a high blood sugar an hour or two after your workout. That's why. There's a reason for it. It's not random and crazy. Okay, so let's give some examples here. Sprints on the treadmill. Sprints are anaerobic because you're doing a lot of intensity and then you come down and you rest. Sprint, maybe it's a minute sprint, maybe it's two minute sprint, and you let your the pace come down and you rest. Ideally, in intervals, especially with sprinting, the rest period would be about two minutes, okay? So the intensity period would never be longer than two minutes. Once you start crossing over that two-minute threshold, you're getting closer and closer to burning glucose. So let's say that my blood sugar was 250 when I started, okay? My blood sugar was high when I started. I had a snack because it was time for a meal. I'm not going to not eat just because I'm a little high. I had an apple with two string cheese. I, I took 50% of a correction for the high blood sugar plus two units for the food. So the two units is what I would normally take for an apple with string cheese 
plus only half of my correction dose. I know that for me that works well during 20 minutes of intervals. My BG at the end was 145. Okay, because I'm going to burn some glucose because I have all this insulin on board and I'm eating. But I'm high, so I'm not plummeting. If, if this wasn't sprints and if it was a 30-minute jog instead, I'd probably go much lower than just 145. And so then I would correct by taking less insulin with my meal. Power yoga. I used to teach yoga. It was definitely an aerobic workout because we were moving constantly. My blood sugar is starting at 110. I have an apple with two string cheese. I knew that I could have an apple or a yogurt, be yogurt before teaching, which is about 15 to 20 grams of carbs and either of those things. Not take insulin and my blood sugar halfway through the class would be 155 and by the end 160. So if I wanted to aim a little lower, right, and keep my blood sugar closer to 100, I actually could have taken a little more insulin for this apple. I took zero, so I could have taken a half unit, and that actually probably would have kept me down at 100, okay? A morning walk, so this is fasted example. I do this all the time. Well, before I had a baby, I did this all the time. <laughs> 95 milligrams per deciliter. I ate nothing. I took no insulin. 45 minutes of walking with three dogs. That's not a slow pace. My blood sugar was 100 at the end. Okay? Fasted walking. It works. It is the easiest time of day to do any type of exercise. If you're really struggling with lows during an aerobic workout and you've gotten to the point where maybe you're even scared to do that jog, to do that exercise, try doing it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. When you know that your basal rates in your pump settings are accurate or your, your long-acting insulin dose, I don't use a pump just for those out there. If you don't use a pump, all of this is still possible. And on that note, you might be wondering, well, can't I just decrease my insulin? Sure, you can, but remember that the insulin you get at 4 p.m. isn't just affecting your blood sugar from 4 to 5 p.m. It's affecting your blood sugar for four hours after it's given to your body. So that's going to screw up with your blood sugars after you finish your workout, depending on how drastically you cut back on that insulin. I find that learning the physiology first, leaving your insulin doses the way they are, and learning the real physiology of what kind of exercise you're doing and how to balance that with carbs or not carbs or adjusting what kind of workout you're doing. If you would rather do sprints because it's easier to manage your blood sugar around instead of jogging for an hour or 30 minutes, go for it. You're going to burn more body fat doing sprints than just straight jogging. So why not? And it's easier to balance your blood sugar during. Here's another example of an aerobic workout, hiking up Ventana Canyon. 112 uh, was my blood sugar. Ventana Canyon's in Arizona. It's a pretty big um, hike. I had a juice box. Later I had an apple. Then I had another juice box. Didn't take any insulin for those things because I know my heart is pounding the whole time. Uh, and it took, I think it was about an hour up. So I had quite a bit of glucose on the way up. My blood sugar was hovering the whole time. I was checking it constantly. At the top of the mountain, I checked again. I was at 160. I knew that going down, I wasn't going to be working nearly as hard as I was going up, right? A fraction of the effort. And it takes half the time to go down. So I did nothing for that 160. I just kept climbing down, and my blood sugar was around 130 by the time I was done because I, my heartbeat wasn't beating fast. I wasn't working really hard. It was more like a mellow walk as far as my body was concerned in terms of how much glucose it was burning for energy. So remember, know your plan. Get good wholesome fuel. You don't need fancy bars. You don't need fancy goos and gels. An apple and some protein is an awesome snack. People resent having to eat something before they exercise because they have diabetes. But figure out how to plan your snacks and your meals around your workout so that you're not eating anything extra. You're just eating one of your normal meals around your exercise and you're just timing it so it's convenient. And then you're not consuming extra calories, which is really, it's really obnoxious to have to consume a bunch of extra stuff just because you want to exercise. So if you normally have a banana halfway through the day, have that banana before your long aerobic workout so that you're not messing around with all that extra calories and you're getting the carbs when your body's going to actually use them the most. Check your blood sugar often and take really good notes and never give up. So... Let me just check on the time, how we're doing here. Okay, so if this goes already the first time and you're really frustrated, 
take a deep breath, step back from what you did, look at how you did it, and take those good notes, and try again. Make an adjustment, consume fewer carbs if you ended up high, take a little insulin if you ended up high. Somebody that is great at coaching around exercise is CDE Jennifer Smith. Jenny, uh, Jennifer at integrateddiabetes.com is her email again. I'm not currently coaching people, um, but I highly recommend reaching out to Jenny if you want more one-on-one -on -one help with this. Thank you, Ginger. Yeah, we, I can't believe we made it under 30 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, if I was rushing, but I was trying we, to cut the time. No, you're, you're great. And um, all the questions that we had during the webinar, we were able to answer during it. So there aren't any questions right now. But ladies out there that are listening to this webinar, if you, if you find that you have questions after we close out the webinar, please send them to us. Send them to us at info at diabetesisters.org, and we will forward them to Ginger. I also wanted to, um, to, to let everyone know that we will have the audio version as well as the slides that Ginger has provided today available tomorrow morning on the Diabetes Sisters website. That's at www.diabetesisters.org. At the very top of the website, there is a tab for Life Class Webinar Series. You will be able to access today's webinar, as well as all of the webinars that we have done this year and last year. Um, before we sign off, I want to thank everyone for registering and participating in today's webinar. We had over 75 people register, and as promised, we've taken all the registrants and we've entered them into a drawing for a copy of one of Ginger's books. The winner for this webinar is Alejandra Marquez, so congratulations, Alejandra. We'll contact you um, so that you can let us know which book of Ginger's you'd like, and then we will get that straightened out and sent out to you. I hope everyone will take away at least one new tip um, on exercise and put it into practice. We'll see you on our next webinar, which is scheduled for June 17th. It will be led by Regina Kelly, and the focus will be summer eating. Thank you, everyone.